Hello and welcome to another complete Cambridge IGCSE biology lesson. In this one we'll be breaking down another alternative to practical paper 6 from the 2023 May-June exam series. Please note this video is relevant whether you're preparing for paper 5 or 6 since both papers are almost exactly the same, at least in terms of where the marks come from. Before we begin, it would be greatly appreciated if you'd take a moment to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Also, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment below and I'll do my best to respond. All right, question number one. A student investigated the nutrient content of three types of drink, drink A, drink B, and drink C. The student used these methods for the three tests on each of the three drinks. So the first is a test for reducing sugars, the Benedict's test. Test, the second, a test for starch involving iodine solution, and the third, the Biorette test for proteins. Now, each of these tests, as well as two others, are covered in my video on topic 4.1, biological molecules. The tests come up frequently in papers 5 and 6, so if you're not familiar, I recommend you go and take a look. Now you could pause the video and carefully study the methods if you like, but I'm going to move on because there's not a huge amount of information here that's actually necessary for the upcoming questions. The student's observations of the three tests are shown in figure 1.1. For the Benedict's test, test 1, drinks A and B were blue and C was brick red. For test 2, drinks B and C were both brown and A was blue black. And for the Biorett test, test 3, drinks B and C were both lilac or purple, while A was blue. Okay, the first thing that you need to do is to prepare a table and record the colours observed by the students for all three tests for each drink. Do not include conclusions in your table. So let's bring up the students' observations again. Okay, the first thing to address here is that our table needs to include the observations for all three tests. So let's start by creating a column to include those. Now, for each of these three tests, we're going to need to input the colours observed for each of the three drinks. So we're going to need to add three more columns to the right of our test column with the headers drink A, drink B and drink C or just A, B and C. Now, given that we're recording the colours observed for each drink, we ought to include that as well, although it's not actually worth a mark. The four marks here are for drawing a minimum of four columns, adding the appropriate headings, recording nine colours, and for recording all nine colours correctly, so let's add those in now. All right, next you need to state which nutrients are present in each drink. So if you've already watched my video on biological molecules, link below, you'll know that Benedict's solution turns brick red in the presence of reducing sugars, iodine turns blue-black in the presence of starch, and biorette reagent turns purple or lilac in the presence of proteins. Therefore, we can conclude that drink A contains starch because we got a positive result for test two, drink B contains protein, because we got a positive result for test 3, and drink C contains both protein and reducing sugars because we got a positive result for test 1 and test 3. Next, identify one safety hazard associated with test 1. They love including questions in papers 5 and 6 on safety. So test 1 was the Benedict's test, and Benedict's reagent is both irritant and corrosive. The test also involves heating the reagent and the test substance in a water bath, so you could have also put hot water as an alternative hazard. Next, the vitamin C content and the fat content of three other drinks, D, E and F, were determined. It was found that drink D contained vitamin C, drink E contained fat, and drink F contained vitamin C and fat. State the reagent used when testing for vitamin C, and that is DCPIP. Describe the method for the emulsion test for fats. So the emulsion test for fats and oils involves adding ethanol and water to the test substance and shaking. Next, the results for one of the drinks are shown in Table 1.1. Identify the drink from the results provided in Table 1.1. So the drink in question turned colourless when tested for vitamin C and produced a white emulsion when tested for fat. So DCPIP turns from blue to colourless in the presence of vitamin C, so we have a positive result there, and mixing ethanol and water with fats results in the formation of a white emulsion, so we have a 
positive result there as well. So all we need to do is to identify the drink that contained both vitamin C and fat, and that was of course drink F, so one mark for that one. Now the next part asks you to explain how you identified the drink from the results provided in table 1.1. And the answer to that is simply that both vitamin C and fat were found to be present in the drink, or in other words, both tests were positive. Okay, next question. Three types of food contain different concentrations of the enzyme catalase. Catalase catalyzes the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide to release water and oxygen gas. The production of oxygen gas can be used to measure the activity of the enzyme. Plan an investigation to compare the concentrations of catalase in the three types of food. So, the first thing I would typically advise you to do when planning an investigation is to state the independent variable and describe how you will change it. However, this experiment is just about comparing three types of food. There's nothing you're actively manipulating, so you can leave out that step and begin with the dependent variable instead. So the dependent variable is the volume of gas released, which I will measure using a gas syringe. Next, you'll want to move on to details of the method, and there are four points you can make here. To prepare the food samples, for example by cutting or grinding. To weigh the food using a balance or scales to ensure that each sample is the same mass, to mix or stir the food with hydrogen peroxide, and finally the method used to collect the gas, which I already mentioned when stating the dependent variable. Next, you'll get up to three marks for mentioning control variables, or things that you need to keep constant during your investigation. The ones I've gone for are temperature, volume of hydrogen peroxide, and time for gas collection, but you could of course also mention the mass and surface area of the food samples. Then you'll get one mark for stating that you will repeat the investigation at least two times, and finally one mark for identifying a safety measure, for example taking care when using a knife or wearing gloves when handling the hydrogen peroxide. The nutrient content of foods can affect a person's bones. We learned about this in topic 7.1 on diet. In a study, the diet and bone density of 120 women were monitored for two years. The women were all between 50 and 70 years of age. The scientists calculated the mean daily calcium intake for each woman and measured the change in density of one of their bones by using x-ray scans. The results for the five women are shown in table 2.1. Okay, we'll come back to that. You need to plot a line graph on the grid of the data in table 2.1, and one axis has been started for you. Okay, so we'll start as always by labeling the axes with units to match the table headers. So mean daily calcium intake, our independent variable, goes on the x-axis, and mean change in bone density, the dependent variable, the thing we're measuring, goes on the y-axis. Next, you'll need to make sure that you use a suitable scale and that your graph occupies at least half of the grid in both directions. Then accurately plot your points, the margin of error specified in the marks scheme is plus or minus half a small square, and finally draw a suitable line connecting the points. Next, you need to state two conclusions for the data in your graph. And remember, conclusions should always relate to the purpose of the investigation, which in this case is the effect of calcium intake on bone density. The conclusions I've gone for are when calcium intake is low, bone density decreases, and a minimum of approximately 1500 milligrams per day is required to maintain bone density. Now, another way of putting this is that there is no change in bone density at approximately 1500 milligrams. If we take a look at the graph again and draw a horizontal line from zero on the y-axis, we can see that it intersects with our line at 1500 milligrams of calcium per day. Another slightly more obvious conclusion we could have made is that when calcium intake is high, bone density increases. Next, you need to identify the independent variable in this investigation, and that is of course calcium intake. 
describe two variables that the scientists should have considered when selecting women for the study. So basically here we need to list any factors that might also influence the dependent variable, the change in bone density. So I've gone for the age of women and other dietary information. Other points in the mark scheme include health status, including whether the participants were using medication or had a bone related condition like osteoporosis, their ethnicity, height, mass, and whether they were pre or post menopause. The next question is to suggest a reason for the large number of women being included in the study. And I've put to increase confidence in results. If we only tested five women, it would be very difficult to draw conclusions from our data. But with big numbers, we can be much more confident that what we're seeing isn't simply a product of chance or error. You could have also put to identify anonymous results or to obtain a sample that is representative of the population. Now, this final point relates to the next question, which is to state one way this study is not representative of the population. And the point that I've gone for here is that it only studies women, so it tells us nothing about the effect of calcium intake on bone density in men. It also only studies the 50 to 70 age range, so tells us nothing about the youth or the elderly. Okay, a student stated that more women were losing bone mass than were gaining bone mass. Explain why this statement may not be correct for the data in this study. And this is because the number of women in each calcium intake category is unknown. So it's possible that there were actually way more women in the groups that gained bone density than in those that lost bone density. Okay, now on to our final question, which always seems to come up in papers 5 and 6. Figure 2.1 is a photograph of a femur, which is a bone in the leg. And we've got line PQ there and the magnification of the image. You need to make a large drawing of the bone shown in figure 2.1 and this is worth four marks. In this case you'll get one mark for drawing an outline that is a single clear line with no shading and one mark for drawing a bone that's at least as large as the image provided. So always use the majority of the space. The other two marks are for specific details so the most obvious details in the image need to be included. There's one mark here for drawing the projection or pointy bit at the top left of the diagram and one for the dark lines on the far left. The length of line PQ represents the length of the femur in figure 2.1. Measure the length of line PQ in figure 2.1. Now the correct answer here is 140 millimeters and you get a margin of error of plus or minus one millimeter. So 141 or 139 would also get you the mark. Use your measurement and the formula to calculate the actual length of the bone and give your answer to three significant figures. So we're going to need to rearrange the equation here as the actual length is on the bottom of the equation provided. The formula triangle shows us that the actual size is equal to image size, that is length of line PQ, over magnification, which is 0.3. So 140 divided by 0.3 is 460. 67 millimeters when rounded to three significant figures. Okay, final question. Very well done if you followed this far and comprehended everything because I have been going fairly quickly. Figure 2.2 shows a bone from a person who had vitamin D deficiency. So this looks like an example of rickets. State two ways the bone in figure 2.2 is different from the bone in figure 2.1. So this is just a case of say what you see. So this bone has a curved shaft, the other one had a straight shaft, and there are markings in the middle of the shaft. You could have also mentioned that the head on the left is twisted at a different angle or that there are two projections visible or simply that the bone is shorter. Okay well done that was everything for this IGCSE biology paper 6 breakdown. Leave a thumbs up if you appreciate or benefited from this video and remember to subscribe if you want to be notified when I upload the next one which will be on the multiple choice papers papers 1 and 2.